What's up everyone and welcome back to the comps channel. By now I'm sure most of you are familiar with the devastation from Hurricane Helene, but it's certainly not getting as much media attention as it should based on how bad it really is, especially in my neck of the woods in Appalachia. Now, my area of East Tennessee was fortunate and didn't see many issues other than some power outages, but about 40 miles east of me is a completely different story. But what I want to talk about in this video are a few things from a recent video by S2 Underground, which I'll link to in the video description because he makes some good points and I do recommend watching it. It seems like we have some mutual subscribers, so some of you have probably already seen it, and in this video he goes into mentioning some of the great work done by ham radio operators who have been responding to the disaster and using the Mont Mitchell repeater, especially one of the net control operators named Dan. And if you're outside of the range of this repeater, there is a live stream of it, which I'll include a link to, and I encourage you to listen to the good work that's being done there. Three days out from the storm now, and people are still alive, trapped, uh, that need the help. So with that, again, my name is K2DMG. My name is Dan, and I will continue running this net as long as needed. I am home, and I am willing to do it for everybody. We still have NG4D on frequency, and we still have Jimmy, who was helping out yesterday and the day before, and for us is ZF. Uh, we are willing to make phone calls and send text messages. One of the things highlighted in the video is some of the people without ham radio license on the repeater needing help. Now, I've heard this myself while Dan was the net control operator, and he works with them and doesn't sweat that they don't have a license, and that's exactly how it should be, because you don't need a license to use a radio in an emergency, which the situation in East Tennessee and Western North Carolina clearly is. Now, Dan has been receiving some well-deserved praise for his work, and I'll echo the same here and say we really appreciate the work he and the other net control operators in the area are doing. So that's some of the good radio-related stuff going on, but in the video he also mentions, unfortunately, seeing some bad hams in this emergency who have been giving the unlicensed people shit for not having a license, which is truly disappointing and shameful. Now, I haven't heard this myself personally, as I've been mostly listening to Dan and the others on the Mont Mitchell repeater, but I don't doubt it as I've heard this happen while storm chasing in Kansas before. Now, I don't know if this was someone in need who wasn't a ham and was having trouble using their radio or what, but whoever it was on the repeater didn't try to find out and immediately dismiss them. Now, this was in an area that I was just arriving in and was unfamiliar with, so there could be some history there with someone intentionally causing interference that I'm not aware of, so we can maybe give him the benefit of the doubt in this case. But the main point I want to bring up, though, is don't be afraid to pick up the radio in an emergency to use it if you need to. And if someone hops on there saying to ignore them since you're unlicensed, remind them that the rules do allow for this. And if they continue complaining, tell them to go pound sand. And if you're a licensed operator and you hear this, you should tell them to go pound sand as well. Now, I will say this, though, if you do have a radio or plan on getting one, I do encourage you to get your ham radio license so you can use it and practice with it before an emergency strike so you're proficient with it and know that your equipment is in working order before it's needed. Everything gets harder to use in stressful situations and if your radio is just sitting in a drawer until needed and you're not as familiar with it as you should be, you may have a harder time reaching people quickly. You don't have to wait to get your license to purchase a radio. None of these radios require a license to purchase, but I just encourage you to get to know your radio while you work on getting your license and listen in to what's in your area, see what frequencies are active, and take note of that so you know what frequencies you're most likely to find help on in the event of emergency. Now, I know not everyone's going to do that, but all I can do is encourage you to get your license or at the very least get to know your radio and what frequencies are active in your area so you know where to go when an emergency hits. Now the last thing I want to go into is towards the end of the video he touched on the nuance as far as radio band allocation and commercialism and everything so I want to go a bit deeper into that here and my thoughts on it. 
So the way I see it, there's a wide mixture of hams, but for the sake of simplicity, I'll split them into three types. There are some hams that like to beat their chest about their ham radio and act as if they're employees of the FCC and look down on people who don't have their license. Then there are some who say they don't need a license, they're never going to get one, and they don't care that their radio has spurious emissions all over the spectrum and so on. Then there's a mixture of those in the middle, which is where I'd place myself at. There are some FCC regulations where I think, okay, I can see why that's in place, like the spurious emissions, for example, and that's why I've shown that test on radio review videos. Now, the ham radio bands themselves are pretty low on the list of what the FCC cares about, but when your radio starts interfering with commercial radio users who are much higher paying and police, fire, and emergency frequencies where public safety is involved, this is when you get into the territory where the FCC will actually respond and work on direction finding you. Now all of these are public record and here's one example where a Topgolf's wireless microphone system which was supposed to be operating in the 506 to 542 megahertz range was also transmitting on 803.920 megahertz which was causing interference to a city's public safety communication system. Now this got reported to the FCC and the FCC tracked down the interference to the Topgolf using direction finding. So this is why I do the spurious emissions tests and it's the neighborly thing to do in general. Aside from that, let's say there is a shit hits the fan situation and you want to limit your radio footprint as much as possible. Do you really want to use a radio that's transmitting on eight frequencies at the same time? Probably not. Now there are some FCC regulations that I think are pretty dumb, like the type acceptance, for example, where if you have a ham radio license that's Mars modded to talk on GMRS and MURS frequencies, the FCC regulations say you can't use that radio to transmit on those other frequencies because it's not type accepted. Why do we have to buy a ham radio, GMRS radio, MURS radio, when you could do all of those with a single radio? Now, I'm not telling you to ignore this regulation, but this is one thing I don't believe the FCC can go after because there's no way to tell that you're using a ham radio on GMRS, FRS, or MURS frequencies, or whatever frequency for that matter. The final sort of nuanced thing I want to mention is the CB radio ban, which was also mentioned in the video, and how the FCC gave up on requiring license, licenses for it because of people not bothering getting licenses anymore. I don't think anyone can say exactly what would happen to the ham radio bands if everyone were to not bother getting licenses anymore, but I don't think the FCC would give up and make them license-free bands like CB radio. There's companies always wanting some of the ham radio bands, like the 220 MHz ham radio band, for example. UPS wanted a chunk of that band, and the FCC gave them 220 to 222 MHz, which left less frequencies for ham radio use. To top it off, UPS didn't end up even using it, and the FCC never gave it back for ham radio use. And as of right now, there's a company called NextNav that wants part of the 33 centimeter ham radio band, which is also what Meshtastic operates on. So based on these companies willing to pay large sums of money for radio spectrum, I think it's more likely that the FCC would sell off these bands rather than give them up for license-free radio use like the CB radio band. So I think that covers my thoughts on everything, so I'll just close out the video with the main points I want to get across. First and foremost, if you don't have a ham radio license and have access to a radio in an emergency, don't be afraid to pick it up and reach out for help and ignore any clown that tells you otherwise. And the final point is definitely call out the bad hams, but understand there's some nuance and just because someone is encouraging you to get your license or recommending to follow certain regulations doesn't mean that they're a sad ham or against freedom of speech or anything like that. They're likely just concerned with what I mentioned earlier. That'll do it for this video. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Thank you all and have a good one.